Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, which today is uh, Speed Matters Intelligent Strategies to Accelerate Data-Driven Decisions, sponsored today by Click. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. To find the Q&A on the chat panels, you can click those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to activate those features. And just to note, Zoom defaults the chat to section to send it just the panelists, but you may absolutely change it to chat with everybody. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our team of speakers for today, Michael Disler and Matt Aslett. Michael is a Senior Director of Product Marketing at Click, responsible for messaging and go-to-market strategies related to big data, IoT, GDPR, Click Data Catalyst, Click Associative Big Data Index, and Click's Architecture and Technology. Matt is a Research Director with responsibility for data, AI, analytics and AI and analytics channel at 451 Research, a part of S&P Global Market Intelligence. Matt's own primary area of focus currently includes data abstraction, virtualization, and analytics acceleration, data culture and data literacy, data streaming, and streaming data integration, as well as hybrid cloud data processing. And with that, I will turn the webinar over, webinar over to Michael and Matt to get us started. Hello and welcome. Thank you very much. And hello, everybody. Thanks for joining. So uh, yeah, as uh, we just uh, talked about, um, I'm Michael Disler and uh, Matt, I'm very excited for Matt to join me today. So Matt's gonna, we're gonna start off with Matt talking about what he's seen in the market today um, regarding data integration analytics, which I think are important factors in this idea of speed matters, the import importance of making uh, data-driven decisions very quickly. Uh, now, I should point out that some of the things he's going to point out uh, today are in a report that he recently developed, and everybody attending is going to get a copy of this report. Uh, so after Matt speaks, I'll follow with a brief discussion about how Click can also contribute to this uh, need for speed. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Uh, thanks, uh, Michael. And uh, yeah, thanks, everyone, for, for joining this, this webinar. And thanks to, to Click for having us. On. So yeah, I'm going to kick things off here just talking about some of the key trends uh, we see, uh, you know, driving uh, change in this space and the importance and benefits of accelerating the path from data to decision. So if we have the next slide, I think, you know, the first thing to, to point out really in relation to that is the growing recognition of the importance of data. Of course, you know, people practitioners working with data, data analysts, data management uh, experts, uh, you know, have long understood the importance of data. And of course, you know, a lot of business decision makers have too. But what we've seen, particularly in recent years, is the growing understanding, particularly at that, you know, senior decision maker level of the importance of data and the fundamental importance of data as potentially a uh, competitive differentiator. And there's, you know, two, two uh, sort of charts here on this slide, which kind of illustrate that, both taken from our Voice of the Enterprise Data Platforms and Analytics uh, survey. And the, you know, the first on the left-hand side here, you can see the importance of data 12 months from now. We always ask organizations or respondents, you know, uh, to what extent do you think data will be more important to your organization a year from now? And as you can see, 81% saying it will be more important. This is since we started doing these surveys, there's always Always been there or thereabouts but it's been sneaking up you know over that time so not only is data already important it is growing in importance uh, as i said particularly anecdotally we see that amongst senior decision makers and the reasons for that you know are, are, are pretty obvious when you look at the the chart on the right hand side here which is the benefits uh, organizations see from um, or expect to see from being more data driven, for having uh, more, more data driven decision making. You know, these are really fundamental uh, sort of business. Uh, priorities, as you can see, things like increasing sales, enhancing customer service and engagement, improving business agility, improving existing or developing new products and, and services. And um, if we go to the next slide, you know, what we've seen, particularly in the last 18 months, is, you know, amid 
COVID, obviously, it's, you know, and the, and the pandemic and all the socioeconomic change that's, that's resulted from that, you know, clearly that has been, you know, uh, has a significant impact on, on all organizations, uh, you know, uh, and a lot of people, you know, in, in a very bad way. But interestingly, if you think about, you know, the way enterprises have responded to that, you can actually argue there's been some sort of benefits of this in terms of accelerating change. And we've seen a proportion of enterprises have actually taken this as an opportunity to develop new products and services, develop new ways of engaging uh, with enterprises, um, you know, sometimes through necessity. Obviously, we've seen fundamental changes from a retail perspective, people for a long time not able to, you know, go into literally into stores in the way they would. So a shift, an acceleration perhaps of, of the shift towards sort of digital commerce, um, but also, you know, enterprises just seeing the opportunities in some cases to evolve the way they do things. So we've even seen this uh, in, in, in industries that have been severely impacted by uh, COVID, such as travel uh, and transport, where actually, you know, the companies have taken the opportunity to invest in new initiatives. Uh, airlines investing in new baggage handling systems, for example, actually given the opportunity to do that because they had less customers to, to deal with. So what we've seen in particular in relation to data and analytics and what this chart actually illustrates is the fact that, um, you know, this sort of acceleration of projects um, uh, is not necessarily evenly distributed and actually it's the companies that have been the most successful with data and analytics to date that stand to gain the most from the investments they've made over the past 18 months so we ask companies about you know one you know the, the, their success rate with data analytics initiatives in the last couple of years and then also about you know whether they've increased spending on data management and analytics uh, products and services and also if they've increased the number of scope of active analytics projects as a result of COVID-19. And as you can see, amongst the most successful, those that say that you know 81% or more of their projects have, have been successful, they're twice as likely as, as the least successful, more than twice as likely as the least successful, to have increased spending on data management and analytics products and services, specifically as a result of COVID-19. So as I said, sort of using that as a, a, a trigger point to actually, you know, put the, the, the foot to the floor, if you like, and accelerate ahead. And um, not quite as the same margin, but almost twice as likely also to have increased the number and scope of an active analytics projects. Again, some of that was through necessity. Obviously, we saw a lot of organizations suddenly found, you know, the data and the projects they, they, they they previously were reliant upon perhaps you know were, 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 just didn't make sense in, in the current scenario but also you know some of that through choice and actually uh, actively uh, investing in data analytics projects you know in order to try and predict obviously in some cases like you know what's going to happen when people return to stores and people return to traveling so if we move to the you know the next slide we can see uh you know, clearly, whilst there are a lot of benefits to being data driven, as we talked about before, there are obviously, you know, some challenges as well. And um, we can, can look at this uh, through the lens of the most data driven companies versus sort of the average company, if you like, or, you know, all respondents to our surveys. And this is kind of interesting because it, it highlights that, you know, one, that being data driven is, is a lot more, you know, easier said than done. There are some real challenges that come along with that. And secondly, that, you know, even amongst the most data driven companies, there are some still some barriers and challenges they face. And what's interesting is that in some cases, those are different barriers. So for example, we've highlighted here a few areas where, you know, all respondents were more concerned or more challenged by uh, some barriers than the most data-driven companies. And perhaps not surprisingly, you know, it's things like budget uh, constraints or skilled resources or a lack of support and involvement from senior leadership. And what we see is that, you know, amongst those more data-driven companies, companies that make a significantly higher proportion of their business decisions driven by data, you know, they have that support from leaders, senior leadership, which obviously, you know, uh, you know, you would say you would understand translates into less budget uh, limitations, although not complete lack of them, and also less challenges in terms of skill resources, although again, not a complete lack of them. 
Interestingly, though, if we go to the, the next slide here, we see that there are some areas where the more data driven companies are actually more challenged or perhaps you could be say more concerned about some uh, barriers than you know the the average respondent if you like so some of these areas uh illustrate where the more you try to do with data actually you know other barriers uh, you know arise or become more more evident so you know one of those we see uh, and we've seen this in, in numerous surveys over the years is data security it's not of course that data security is is not a, a challenge for in the early stages of a project but certainly i think the more ambitious you are as an organization you know with data the more you try to do with data the more security uh concerns you know come to the fore uh, and privacy obviously is another area which uh is is, is uh, similar to that and then also building and maintaining the data infrastructure that can support these analytics projects. Um, again, it's not that, you know, it's sort of in the early stages, these things are easy, but obviously if we're with a, perhaps a small tactical initiative, you don't get the complexity of challenges you perhaps get uh, as again, you try to be more ambitious as a company and have a more strategic uh, approach to being data driven. If we go to the next slide, you know, one of the, the key uh, challenges we see that affects organizations of, you know, of all uh, type, you know, regardless of how sort of ambitious they are in relation to data, is the time taken to actually generate insight from data. And as you can see here, you know, uh, this is looking at all respondents, you know, 60% of respondents saying it takes them more than three days to generate insight from raw data. And this is, as I say, is an ongoing problem. And it's, it's a significant problem because as we look at the next slide, we can see there are some really significant business benefits to be had from, uh, you know, from, from reducing that time and reducing those delays. And, you know, these are fundamental business uh, priorities, things like increasing sales. Uh, improving business agility, enhancing customer service and engagement, um, and, and, and also things like empowering uh, and aligning internal decision makers across different departments of the organization. So, you know, there are some really significant benefits to be, benefits to be had. And as we saw earlier, it's the most data-driven companies, it's the most successful to date with data and analytics that stand to gain the most from those as they continue their investment in, in, in data products and services. Now, you know, if we go to the next slide, you know, what, one of the ways we talk about this is about accelerating that path from data to decision. You know, and what we see is that particularly, you know, modern uh, data projects require approaches that are not burdened by traditional assumptions about the path from data to, to decision being served by standalone products and services. Now, you know, this is obviously this graphic here is a simplification, but if you think about, you know, the processes involved from going from, from data to some kind of business decision, they can more or less be, be, you know, divided into three groups. There's ingestion of data and integration of data. There's then the storage and processing of data. And then obviously there's the visualization and analysis of that data. What we've seen is historically, uh, you know, these were three distinct steps in the process that were served by three distinct products and technologies, historically delivered by three different vendors. Now, you know, through uh, both merger and acquisition activity and research and development, clearly, I think, you know, most, most data and analytics uh, providers today can, can address uh, all of these steps but still often with three different products and or, or with functionality that's aimed at three different groups of users. Um, and what we see is that overall, there are really potential opportunities to, to deliver enhanced efficiency and reduce data friction between data consumers and, and, and the people who are responsible for, uh, you know, the, the operating and, and maintaining the data architecture through the use of, of unified data plat platforms that actually consolidate the functionality required to accelerate the path uh, from data to decision. Now, of course, uh, if we go to the next slide, you know, data uh, acceleration of data initiatives isn't just about products and services. So I wanted to you know, make that absolutely clear. 
um, you know, we see, so this is a chart here shows the sort of the top three steps that, that survey respondents tell us they have taken to improve data culture in their organization. And, you know, on the, on the far right there, we see investing in improving employee data literacy and skills is, you know, is a significant response, 35% of respondents selecting that. With that said, we actually do see that in many organizations, they still do take, let's say, like a product first approach to uh, improving data culture and being more data driven. There's still that mentality that starts with the products. Um, and, you know, the top two answers here were then investing in new analytics products and services. 40% of respondents selected that. And then interestingly, ahead of that, investing in new data management products and services with 44%. And that actually reflects something we've been uh, talking about and, and writing about in our research uh, quite a bit actually over the last couple of years in that data management as an enabler for um, in, uh, you know, enhanced analytics and particularly self-service analytics. You need you know, the fundamental uh, data management and data governance uh, capabilities to actually, uh, you know, to be in place to enable organizations to, to go faster. Um, but, you know, as we say, you know, this sort of really highlights the fact that for many organizations, they're still taking a product centric approach uh, to, to, to improving data culture. Now, um, if we go to the next slide, Michael mentioned earlier, uh, you know, this, this report we, we published last, uh, late last year, talking about enterprise intelligence platforms and the, the role that they have to play in accelerating the path from data to decision. And to say, you know, this, this wasn't a sort of a one-off report. This is part of a, you know, a, a series actually we've done. And this concept of the enterprise intelligence platform has been part of our research for the last couple of years. And the reason we, I, I picked out a couple of sort of key uh, sentences, you know, from the report because they really highlight, you know, what we see uh, is happening and the reasons for sort of changing attitudes in this space. And, and the first is, you know, despite obviously enormous innovation across the data and analytics sector in, in recent years, um, we see that there is for many organizations a gap between what's theoretically possible, if you look at sort of the state of the, the art of data and analytics, and, and what they're actually able to, to deliver and, and the extent to which their investments can make a practical, meaningful impact on business decision making. And there are multiple reasons for that, of course, but one of them that we see is that in many companies, projects remain built around the idea of pipelines and analytic processes that assume those you know three steps that we talked about previously um, are, 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 are provided for with standalone products for data integration data processing uh, and analytics and that there is a fundamental requirement on three different technologies for people in three different roles um, uh, on, on, on that path from data to decision. So we, have, as I said, have described sort of what we see as the, the, the alternative as, as an enterprise intelligence platform. If we go to the next slide, we can see the extent to which um, we see that demand is evolving for uh, products that actually deliver a consolidated platform that addresses those, all those three steps in, this, in a single environment. Obviously with functionality still aimed at different users, but with uh, a single environment. And we actually saw that, you know, nearly half, 46% of respondents said, you know, for, for a greenfield analytics initiative and assuming, you know, all things being equal function on a, on a functionality basis, that they would actually have a preference for a, a consolidated platform. Clearly that's, you know, that's less than half, 54% said they'd, they'd uh, have a preference for multiple standalone offerings. But if you think that, you know, multiple standalone offerings was the default for so long, I think that, you know, we saw this as actually showing that there's a significant level of, of interest and not just interest, but a preference actually for a, you know, some sort of consolidated environment. If you go to the next slide, you know, we, we look at, uh, you know, what we see as some of the requirements that, that, that we would, uh, we would uh, refer to as an enterprise intelligence platform. And there, there's a couple here, and I'll describe these in you know, a little bit more detail. So the first is sort of load data first and ask questions later. We've seen, you know, the, the, uh, the way in which companies think about the, the, the loading data into what was, you know, traditionally a data warehouse environment has evolved. And increasingly organizations 
are, are looking to use the, the processing power of the data storage and processing platform to apply uh, schema at query time rather than, than predefining that, that schema as they load data in. And that's been you know, a fundamental shift that's been going on over multiple years and is driving adoption of, of emerging technologies uh, and emerging data platforms. Uh, the second, we talk about sort of all the data all the time, uh, you know, companies, clearly are trying to uh, make use of as much data as, as is, uh, as is uh, you know, possible, uh, economically possible uh, to perform their, their analytics queries uh, in order to, to get, uh, you know, the, the, the highest value. Um, and, you know, we see that, um, uh, you know, one of the ways of doing that is to, uh, is to sort of, uh, um, uh, use uh, metadata to actually automate the identification and tagging of data as it's ingested into to an environment. Um, and then, as I said, that helps to, to uh, then uh, enable sort of the, uh, the application of schema at query time. Uh, we also see that in addition to enabling enterprises to process data uh, that's persisted natively, uh, you know, modern uh, enterprise intelligence data platforms should also enable users to incorporate the results of queries performed in data in other locations uh, uh, as required. So clearly, especially as we see data is increasingly spread across multiple clouds, as well as on-premises data centers, uh, you know, uh, as well as uh, uh, software as service applications, there is uh, an increasing need to be able to query data in multiple locations, in multiple services. Uh, uh, to, to have a complete view of uh, that data rather than the traditional approach of pulling that all into a single sort of consolidated uh, you know, data warehouse. Uh, thirdly, take the query to, to the data. I mentioned, you know, obviously an increasing volume of data is now in cloud storage services. And as that grows, it's become increasingly impractical to, to move that data around. Um, and instead, we see many uh, enterprises uh, investing in, in, in taking the query to the data, taking advantage of things like query, data, uh, query federation, data virtualization capabilities to analyze data in and across multiple locations without having to first move and transform it. Uh, reduced data friction is another key uh, uh, element. You know, modern data platforms we think should enable multiple users to have access to and make use of the same data for multiple purposes. Clearly, that's easier said than, than done. But uh, you know, we we see that is is something that a lot of enterprises are focused on, particularly in terms of reducing you know the friction between data consumers, so data analysts, analysts, developers, senior decision makers, and data operators, so data managers and IT professionals and you know reduce the friction between those two groups uh, and and that being a key way of accelerating uh, uh, you know data driven decision making and then finally support obviously analytics innovation so you know we see that um, you know providing uh, access to data for multiple purposes is an enabler of analytics innovation because it gives users the ability to explore data and rapidly iterate analytics projects uh, innovation is also enabled by support for more advanced analytics functionality obviously you know data science machine learning predictive analytics capabilities as part of the overall sort of and uh, data and analytics portfolio. So on to the, the next slide, uh, we're just sort of uh, wrapping up here really in terms of the, the, the key points uh, in terms of the, you know, there's been a sort of a rapid look at some of the key trends we see shaping this, this space. Um, you know, we do see that, you know, in order to remain competitive, uh, especially obviously given the, uh, you know, the fast changing socioeconomic conditions that we've seen in the, in the last year and a half, enterprises, uh, need to invest in data and analytics products, services, and functionality that support business agility. Um, and as we said, you know, we've seen it, especially the most data-driven, the most successful with data and analytics uh, are the ones that have actually, you know, accelerated ahead with doing that during the pandemic and, and are, are, are therefore accelerating that path from data to decision. You know, I talked about the three steps on the path from data to decision, data ingestion, integration, data storage, data processing, data visualization and analysis. And that clearly at each of those steps, there are opportunities to deliver improved efficiency and reduce data friction. But also uh, we see 
uh, that you know they, a, a combined enterprise intelligence platform can potentially uh, provide uh, a single environment that can uh, can also uh, you know improve efficiency and accelerate that path from data to decision. Clearly, the acceleration of business insight relies on a combination. Of, of capabilities that to deliver more agile approaches to data ingestion and data integration. Um, and also, you know, we talked about the role that data literacy has to play. It's clearly not all about products and services, as I said, but together, you know, the, these uh, capabilities can drive the acceleration of multiple business intelligence and analytics tools by multiple users across an organization for multiple purposes. Uh, so with that, I'll thank you for your time. And I think maybe there's a few questions already come in while I've been talking, so we'll, we'll come to those in due course. But for now, I'll hand you uh, back to Michael and uh, let him can continue with the, the presentation here. Thank you very much, Matt. That was great. Some great uh, insights. And yeah, we've already seen a number of great questions come in and we'll be answering them in just a couple of minutes. Uh, I wanted to spend a little bit of time just talking about how uh, Click fits in with some of these trends and uh, recommendations that Matt just talked about. You know, he put up this, uh, I think, a nice little visualization of kind of the, what I call it's like the flow of data going from kind of raw data to making a decision about it. Uh, and actually, Click has a fairly uh, similar type of uh, little uh, diagram, uh, the same kind of thing, where you start with raw data, we call informed actions as opposed to decisions. And we divided a very kind of very simple point of view to these these four steps. First, to free it, you know, freeing the data from various uh, raw data repositories that it may be very hard to get to, uh, finding it. Uh, basically, great, I free the data, but how do I make sure everybody in the organization can find the data they're looking for? Understand it is, of course, more on the analysis, uh, generating some analysis and hopefully gaining some insights in the data. And then finally, action it not just to, to look at information and do some analysis, but to do something with that information. And we have kind of put it together in terms of our products. If you haven't um, looked at Click in a while, uh, you'll find that we're no longer just a data visualization. That certainly is our heritage, uh, but we've really expanded our portfolio since then, and we're really more uh, of an end-to-end -end solution spanning this whole um, uh, phase from raw data to informed actions. And just want to spend a little bit of time uh, going over kind of the three main components of our overall portfolio, which is around data integration, data analytics, and then uh, what we call data literacy as a service, which is really more around customer success. So uh, data integration. So that's really focused on the kind of points in the flow of freeing the data, free it, and finding the data, find it. So first important point, I think, for Click is what we call our change data capture technology. So this is the whole idea about being able to uh, support the movement of data in real time, what some people call real-time data streaming. And we do it in a very highly efficient, a high performance way. Unfortunately, I think, and I think um, Matt showed us a bit, you know, the, the days of having nightly updates uh, to your data is really uh, not sufficient as more and more people want to get that information. They want to get in real time. Uh, but they want to be able to do this, get this information, get it in real time without having a big impact to that source database. You know, DBAs are very protective of their databases. And if you start hammering it and really affecting the performance to pull the data out, they don't like that. Uh, and so we have a method that really is a very low impact way, can very scalable, uh, and we detect a change in the data itself or a change in the model. Uh, and we immediately update that target environment. So it's a very highly efficient and somewhat unique approach to the movement of data. Second is around uh, data automation, and Matt touched upon this too, the idea of uh, going to more cloud-based uh, data warehouses. And certainly we're seeing that with a huge number of customers. They want to go to things like Snowflake and Databricks and stuff like that. But, but how do they do that uh, at scale um, without a lot of time and resources? because I think the classic way to do this is you provide, you have some very highly skilled technical resources, uh, developing code, developing ETL code to pull the data out, coming up with a model, how it's gonna be in the new uh, data warehouse. That's a lot of time, uh, a lot of effort, and quite frankly, uh, a lot of bit of risk because you're manually 
putting together this whole uh, uh, process. So we offer automated capabilities and are very con uh, using a configuration type tools to really model what that cloud-based uh, data warehouse or data lake is gonna look like. And then we automatically generate the ETL code kind of behind the scenes that, that hundreds or thousands of lines of ETL code is generated automatically. So that's a huge improvement. It means, very, of course, it could be done a lot quicker uh, than doing the manual effort, um, a lot less cost uh, in terms of the time and resources, and also improves the, the literally lowers the risk because you're, it's, a, it's a repeatable automated process. Uh, it, last thing that's very important is that it improves your flexibility. You know, I think there's some people who think we finally got everything onto perhaps uh, this particular cloud uh, warehouse, um, but all of a sudden a new CIO comes in, he says he wants to change to another another warehouse. Um, that could be a lot of effort in a more manual uh, mode, but with our tools at Click, you're simply telling it, we're now pointing to this type of data warehouse and it regenerates all that ETL code behind the scenes again. So really helps you being flexible. Uh, lastly is around data catalog. And this is really a more around the, the find it area. You know, it's great that we can free the data, but how do I know exactly what data I have? I've Great, I've moved all this data to that cloud data warehouse. What do I have exactly? And how do I let everybody know what this is? And that's really where our catalog comes into play, enriching, preparing, and even help delivering this trusted uh, governed uh, data. So that's on the data integration side. Uh, on the data analytics side, uh, again, if you've heard a click in the past, one of our key uh, differentiators is what we call the associate engine or the associate difference. And that's still a, a huge important factor for us. This basically, I, I like the, the term peripheral vision. Um, it gives your users to see kind of the, the, what we call the whole story of their data. Uh, let's just take a really simple example. In your, in your, you wanna see all the sales in the Northeast uh, and your typical SQL based solution when it's going to drilling down, it's only going to bring back what sold in the Northeast. But Click is kind of maintain that data in context, and it's not excluding other data. It's bringing all the related data back. And so, for example, one thing you may see with Click is not only what you sold in the Northeast, but what did not sell in the Northeast. Maybe things that you were, you were expecting to be sold, but didn't happen. Or perhaps you're seeing that this product didn't sell very well. I wanna see immediately uh, what the, how this product sold in other parts of the country. A lot of SQL type based tools, that would be another query, another wait uh, to, the, to get that data out. That all those links are automatically uh, put together within our associate engine. You can immediately change course and now look, instead of looking at sales in the Northeast, looking at how a particular product sold uh, across the country. So it's that type of context, giving you that kind of idea of peripheral vision versus more really of a tunnel vision with other solutions that really can en enrich the analytic experience for everybody. Uh, next important point around analytics for us is our what we call our augmented an analytics. So this is really building upon the associative engine and adding a, a unique kind of cognitive engine ability. So they things like machine learning uh, to and really enrich the analytic experience of all users. Now I say enrich, I think some people, when they hear about AI or machine learning, they, it's really kind of more of a black box approach where there's the, the, the human isn't really involved uh, in the process. We don't really see that. We really see that this can, as we say, augment the user. So really taking that uh, data, uh, applying some, uh, in, some technology to it and generating some more insights and really help the user, empower the user, enrich the user in what type of insights they can find within the data. Uh, lastly, around data analytics is what we call kind of embedded, embedded at the point of decision. And really this is around the concept of that instead of the user having to go to analytics, bringing the analytics to the user. Uh, so that could be in the form of perhaps uh, within their, their portal, their maybe the various enterprise applications that uh, your users are using across the organization, your intranets, extranets, the idea that within that overall view that they're used to, now a click can be part of that, that view. Or perhaps you want to have click kind of more working in the background, have all they kind of be the engine to generate those insights. But from the user's point of view, they're looking at a, a, a custom UI that they're used to. Uh, and we have a full set of open APIs and that allows uh, users to do that. So the, the user doesn't even know 
that uh, Click is behind the scenes uh, generating those insights. So the last uh, part of our flow is what we call data literacy as a service. This is really focused on our, our customer success. Um, first, not surprisingly, we offer enterprise support. We have global companies around the world. We have over uh, 50,000 customers around the world. Many of them are large enterprise customers. They need that around the clock support. And of course, we provide that. A signature services really is what we're saying here is the idea that we're going to basically tailor what our customer needs in terms of consulting and education. It's not kind of a, a generic one size fits all. Uh, we'll we'll ta tailor exactly what education, um, what consulting you need for your particular uh, purchase, for your particular environment. And lastly, around data literacy, and this is something that Matt touched upon, which we also think is, is very important, the idea of data literacy. You know, certainly, as he pointed out, people are thinking that buying the, the technology, uh, the analytics or the data integration technology is important. Um, but if your users don't understand the data that they're looking at, all the technology in the world isn't going to help. Um, so this has been a really a strong push for Click. We've been um, really kind of been pushing on this and investing on it in the last few years. We have consulting, education, certification, assessments, all around the concept of data literacy. And very importantly, all these programs are product agnostic. It's really not showing the, the Click products. It's really talking about the concepts of data literacy. Uh, by the way, if you're interested, if you want to see for yourself, maybe how data literate you are. There's a, a free assessment on our site. Again, it has nothing to do with the product. So if you want to check it out and see how data literate you are, feel free to check that out. Uh, so again, that's kind of the three main concepts uh, that, that Click now offers in terms of portfolio, the data integration, the data analytics, and data literacy. Um, let's talk about an example about how customers are making use of that. The first one is a company called IA American Warranty. Uh, as the name sounds, they're in the warranty business around warranties for cars in uh, North America. And they have both our data integration and data analytics products uh, within their, their organization. And some huge, and see under the value uh, column there, some huge gains in terms of, you know, we talk about the need for speed, huge gains in terms of speed, uh, getting the data ready, a 10x improvement there, developer productivity, a 5x improvement, uh, really were able to rapidly uh, get up to speed and get deployed very quickly. They were seeing some great insights after three months. Uh, I like the, the quote on the right here. Turns out a lot of their assumptions were wrong. Uh, Click has changed how we see our customers in business. Uh, that, is, that is really something that we see with a lot of our, our customers, they say, um, they, that they find that not only does Click provide a lot of value in showing what happened, uh, but also showing what did not happen. Again, my simple example before about what were sales in the Northeast, being able to show what did not happen, what did not sell in the Northeast is probably more, uh, same or if more valuable than showing what did happen. Um, talked about the idea of data literacy. You know, they had an 80% adoption rate after three months. So it was a really, um, a really great uh, example here of a customer making use of the full breadth of our tools and showing some great ROI, some great, uh, some great payback. So um, again, we talked about this idea, this flow, this free it, find it, understand it and action it. Um, but we really don't wanna stop there. We are taking our vision kind of the next level and, and building upon all these building blocks into something that we call active intelligence. Uh, and active intelligence, what do we mean by that? You know, really kind of simply, as the, the word implies, it's being more active, it's being more agile. If you think about more traditional BI, uh, traditional BI is the round that you have this particular kind of curated data set. Here's your, your data, uh, here's your particular dashboard. This is what you get, no changes are allowed. Um, that's not the real world these days. It has to be very, you have to be very agile, very active. You have to react in real time. Um, Certainly things like COVID show the need to uh, react very quickly to the current situation. And so active intelligence means using real time data, using up to the date information. Uh, it's kind of looking back at traditional BI, the, the idea of not having a, a govern and then data pipeline, I think is, has been seen. I even see many people are still using Excel as their quote unquote data pipeline to move data around. That's, that's really not a very, a good governed repeatable method. Uh, 
So another part of active intelligence is having that intelligent analytic, anal, excuse me, analytics data pipeline. The idea that it's repeatable, that it's automated, uh, that it can automatically, intelligently uh, profile the information, transform the data, that's very important too. And the last, uh, just by the term active intelligence, you know, traditional is more designed to inform, not compel action. And really active intelligence, an important point is to do something with the data, not just look at it, not just to discover insights, but actually do something, trigger that immediate actions. So if some of this maybe sound a little familiar, that, that's, I, I agree it, it should, because really I think there's goes very well with what Matt was just talking about in terms of the uh, enterprise intelligent platforms, really active intelligence, I think uh, is a very much fits with that concept of the, the enterprise intelligent platforms. So just to wrap up, just talk about two more customer examples of here of, uh, of customers that have really made use of our active intelligence uh, tools. Uh, one is uh, JB Hunt. So JB Hunt is a, a shipper and a logistics uh, supplier um, in North America. If you've driven on the highways, I actually just saw one of their trucks on the road this morning. Uh, and so the issue was they had a lot of different data sources, um, but they didn't have um, many people to manage those data resources. And so what they were doing were manually loading the data once a day to get some reports about what was going on. And certainly when you have trucks on the road all over the country, once a day getting updates isn't very, very timely information. So they had all these different data sources. How do they ingest it all very quickly? Uh, they also had a lot of different kinds of data. They had blob data, they had structured data, all different kinds of data. So they needed some type of automated process. They needed this thing to run 24-7. Uh, and Click really helped them made it very efficiently, maybe for their team, pull all that data together and give uh, basically for them real time was one to two minutes lag. Um, so now when they get a call from uh, uh, shippers and carriers, where is my uh, truckload of, of goods right now? They can tell them that. They can give them real time insight into where their goods are. So really a huge amount of value add for them, but they didn't have to add a lot of resources. They didn't have to add a lot of infrastructure. Um, made use of the, the uh, people that they had already and become a lot more um, proficient and productive. Last, uh, you know, we talked about COVID. So uh, here is an, actually an example of COVID. This is a uh, regional hospital in the uh, UK. Uh, and they, not surprisingly, had to adapt very quickly due to COVID. Uh, fortunately, they had already had Click in, in installed and were using already and implemented it. Um, so they were fortunately knowledgeable and had begun their, their basically their analytics journey. Uh, but they were really uh, uh, focused before COVID hit more on long-term improvement efforts. Uh, and so they quickly had to change and it turned in quite frankly into a survival tool to handle the rapidly changing um, events of, of COVID. Uh, they adapted various dashboards so nurses could note where patients were and their COVID status. You know, previously to before COVID, it didn't matter uh, what type of ailment or patient in uh, one room to the patient in the next room. Uh, now, of course, you wanted to have all your COVID folks in one wing or one hallway of the hospital and make sure they were isolated from the rest of the patients in the hospital and, and Click allowed the nurses to get very much up-to-date information about what was going on and where all the patients were and what patients were gonna coming into the, the ward. Uh, also helped them with quickly capturing pandemic related matters such as uh, how much oxygen they had, which of course is a very uh, important tool in treating people with COVID and making sure that they, if they're running low, they could plan ahead and order more oxygen in time. Um, sadly, one of the things they kept track of was the mortuary uh, capacity, uh, making sure there was enough, enough space there if need be. They had actually, this hospital chain actually hired a data scientist uh, before COVID started, and that data scientist was actually doing some uh, predictive modeling, um, but that predictive modeling was based on eight-week averages. Well, naturally, in COVID, a lot can change in eight weeks. Um, so that was pretty much irrelevant, um, but they were able to adapt that and make, basically use the results of the last few days to do modeling on it, and they were able to really make some very accurate predictions based on those current trends. Um, this was pretty important because this hospital 
uh, chain had actually the fewest number of uh, critical care or what's a biblical ICU intensive care units in their overall part of the country. And so it was really critical for them to understand exactly um, predicting how many beds they're going to need, how many uh, uh, accurate, um, excuse me, critical care, intensive care beds they're going to need in the, in the future. Um, so this has been a huge update to them. As I said, being able to get live updates on what's going on was uh, extremely important for them. Okay, so just to wrap things up, and again, I see the questions coming in, which is great. Um, you know, I talked about this very simple flow of free it, find it, understand it, and action it. You know, if you put kind of layer over it various types of analysis, I think from the left, you think about free it and you just kind of, then, well, that's great. You can now discover, you know, some data and just do some maybe analysis, just discovering what you have. You follow that all the way to the right and you have with action, you have alerting type analysis. So really, if I kind of lay over a time scale for this, really, I like to say it's kind of going from slow to fast. You know, the, what the, the, the time to answer scale is kind of going from slow to fast. Uh, and that I think is really kind of a, a theme hopefully you've seen in this uh, webinar today that really what we're talking about is how can we streamline the time to answer? How can we make it quicker uh, to get the, the data you need, to get the insights you need, to take the action that you need to take? Um, that's I think really an important point. Hopefully you've gained a couple of uh, important uh, points and maybe some, some good insight on this based on this webinar. So again, just wanted to remind everybody, uh, Bart, thank you for attending this webinar. Everybody attending is gonna get a copy of this um, Enterprise Intelligent Platform from 451 Research. You'll be getting that afterwards. If you're interested in learning more about active intelligence, this term I just talked about with Click, so feel free to go to click.com slash active intelligence. And with that, I believe we are open to have questions. Michael and Matt, thank you so much for this great presentation. We do have a lot of questions coming in. To answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and the recording and the report that uh, was just mentioned as well. Um, and if you have questions for Michael and Matt, feel free to submit them in the Q&A portion of your screen. So diving in here, um, how do you get around building a data pipeline that puts data in a systematic layer that uses, uh, users can understand versus just providing raw data? Building that pipeline is the most time consuming part of providing data for self-service, it seems. Yeah, well, I, I'll, I'll take a stab at that first. I mean, I think that that's part of, you know, what we, when I talked about it in terms of that, I think the classic situation in building that pipeline, as you say, is, is very time consuming. Um, I think because you're the traditional way is using kind of a manual effort to put together that pipeline. You know, I think by if by having an automated way to define that pipeline and, and keep an eye on that pipeline and, and make sure it runs the same way every time, um, I think that's that's an important aspect of, of streamlining that that process. And, you know, a question came in earlier that's kind of along those lines into the chat section, you know, what's the likely point of failure, people, process, or tech solution? Right? And I bring that to both you guys. Yeah, good question. I'll take that first, and then maybe, Matt, you can give your go. I, I, oh. I, I think, um, you know, I think it's, to me, a, a likely point of failure is what I call more culture, which I think is sort of a combination of people and processes. You know, as it, I talked about earlier, you know, technology, yes, yeah, certainly you do need the right technology. But if the, the people aren't on board, if you don't have the process in place to support that, if the, if the executive staff is not on board, you know, that's just not the culture. Um, that's my experience has been more the, the likely point of failure. Yeah, I, 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 I think I'd, I'd agree with that. I was, I was just thinking about this question while, while, while Michael was talking there. And I sort of go back to one of the slides I said about, you know, one of the reasons I think we see that there is perhaps a gap between what is technically possible with the products that are, uh, that are available today, what companies are achieving is, you know, it, it comes down to, to potentially sort of the, the, the culture, also sort of assumptions about the way things should be done, but based on the way they have historically been done. And, and obviously that is a combination of people and, and process, but yeah, ultimately it comes down to perhaps a, some of the, the cultural aspect. 
Love it. So many great questions coming in. So what are things you can do to remove data friction? Yeah, I can, I can, I can start with that. And I, and I think um, there was, I saw there was some chat and people talking about, you know, perhaps the, you know, the, the, the fact that, as I said on the, the slide, many projects seem to be sort of product driven initiatives seem to be product driven but clearly you know data literacy and skills was was third on the list of, of, of the steps organizations are taking to to improve data culture so it, that i think that does show that you know companies are trying to to address that um obviously i only talked about the top three in that particular slide and some of the other things you know that we've seen uh companies doing is is trying to sort of you know particularly in relation to, to, to reducing data friction is uh, about organizational or cultural change. So sort of fostering collaboration between, you know, those data owners, and data providers and consumers and operators. You know, I think if it, where organizations can, uh, um, you know, create a, a, a culture of being data driven, then it often comes from above, whether it's the CEO the COO, the CIO was increasingly CDOs or someone of an equivalent title, you know, they, they can drive uh, change and they can get people in literally in the same room. Well, <laughs> maybe not over the last 18 months, but on the same Zoom call or, or what have you and get people talking and encourage people to talk. And I think another part of it is actually talking about success stories. Uh, you know, it sounds really simple, but we've seen, I've seen organizations, this can be really successful actually talking about not just the outcomes, but, but the data and analytics processes and collaboration that enabled those outcomes and, and just get that, uh, uh, again, it's, it's part of that culture. And I suppose it's part of data literacy really is, is that understanding of, of the, the role that data and analytics has to play uh, in, 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 you know, throughout the decision-making process. Lovely. So um, I'm surprised that companies do not invest more on um, a, a, a people. Are, are people not key to, in the move to data? Yeah, and I think, you know, this, this question obviously, you know, to some extent, sort of, you know, it was very much related to, to the one we just answered and, and again you know when we look at the steps people are taking uh, companies i should say are taking to to improve data culture it, it, it's it's a fair point that you know obviously you know as i highlighted the top two are about products and and it would seem from that that people are, are forgotten but i do you know we do see that there are other steps companies are taking you know investing in analytic skills across you know, not just in in the you know the data and analytics team, but across an organisation. You know, I talked about the role potentially of the chief data officer or a chief analytics officer or you know someone of that ilk. You know, we do see that that uh, companies are investing in that role. Um, uh, it, you know, actually potentially, uh, we see some companies reorganising the way they spread analytics uh, skills, uh, or, or I should say people with analytics skills across a company, you know, perhaps less of a, a centralized uh, group and actually distribute them within departments. And, and so, yeah, there's multiple steps and obviously, you know, uh, it depends on from company to company, uh, which they take. And, and to be fair, you know, all of those things I just talked about do appear lower down in, in the list, particularly, well, from our surveys at least of, of steps companies are taking, but they, they are on the list. They are things companies are doing. And I think, you know, the, the fact that data literacy uh, was there in third place is, you know, should be seen as a positive sign, you know, even if, as I mentioned earlier, you know, it still seems that for a lot of companies, you know, their first uh, sort of step is very often still around, around choosing a product, uh, uh, but there are other aspects to it. Great. So in what ways does uh, agility differ between retail applications and more complex applications in healthcare, such as clinical decision support systems? Uh, not, we also are not familiar with clinical decision support systems. So, um, yeah, I mean, just to, just to be clear, I, I gave a you know, examples we gave were of using of data analytics in particular industries, but um, our solution is not focused on, you know, can be used by many, many different industries. So 
Um, to be honest, I'm not sure. We, we may be a little of an apples and oranges type comparison here. Chair, I'll ask, I'll ask that question if they have additional clarifying, clarifying comments for that. Um, so, but moving on here, so looking down, so that does uh, the associative difference get created automatically based on the data or does the person who creates the visualization need to do something to ensure it is available? No, it happens automatically and it automatically, it brings it basically in memory. So that's why part of its, its speed in terms of when you go in different directions and, and not having any lag. Uh, so it happens automatically and it, and it makes all the relationships automatically. Get a little techie here. It's almost like a, uh, think of it as a complete outer join. Um, and the cool thing is that it will do this not just with data from one data source, but it can, if you pull in data from multiple sources, it will make all those relationships and connections across all those multiple data sources. So it's a really great way to do some analysis when you're not just looking at one data set, but multiple different data sets from different locations and different sources. And I'm assuming throughout these that you all are gonna jump in if you have additional things to add. So Matt and it's over both of you. So let me uh, keep cruising on here. Um, Given the need for accelerating data decision making, especially post COVID-19, any thoughts on implications with regards to ethics, especially when considering diverse cultural um, perceptions? Yeah, well, I'll take that first and maybe Matt, if you want to yeah. add. I mean, I think sure. this is, first of all, I goes back to the idea of culture. I think, you know, that's a very important part of uh, introducing new, new systems and stuff like that to keep in mind the, the, the culture. Um, but this also goes to the point, as we said, we take the look of when you have all these um, new technology and things like artificial intelligence, stuff like that, you know, we look at it as, as an augmented, not a black box. I think that can, you know, really get into ethical situations where you have the system make a decision and carry it out for by itself without any p people involved. And there's been uh, some both humorous and non-humorous examples of that. Unfortunately, I, I, I've you may read it in the media. Um, so it's, a, even though you're accelerating data decisions, I think it's extremely important to have the, the human involved in that, not just totally automated. And then secondly, just in terms of, you still have the issues of, of security and uh, protecting private information, uh, as well as, as the point out here, the different cultural perceptions, depending on what uh, region of the world you're working in. Yeah, and uh, I, I'd agree with that. And I think, you know, within our research, and, and by our here, I mean not just 451 Research, but also our, our parent company, S&P Global, uh, and, and the market intelligence uh, part of that, uh, we see, you know, a very, a really significant shift in the last uh, year or so to focus on, you know, environmental, social, and governance aspects. And I think from a data and analytics perspective, one of the key areas we see that is, is around ethics. I think, you know, uh, people generally won't be their employees or consumers, obviously, we're, we're all both of those have, you know, a much greater awareness of, of uh, you know, ethical challenges um, around uh, uh, the use of data, whether that's, you know, through a, a regulatory, for regulatory reasons, or just, you know, understanding, you know, bias uh, inherent in, especially as, as uh, decisions are potentially uh, increasingly automated. So, so yeah, I think it is something that we see is increasingly uh, top of mind uh, for uh, consumers and employees, and therefore, obviously, decision makers within organisations, and of course, you know, in the you know the the developers and data scientists as they are creating these models, they they need to be cognizant of of those issues, and I think they we we do see that they increasingly are. Well, I love good timing and that's such perfect timing as we reach the end of the questions here and uh, reach the end of the hour. Um, so just a reminder again uh, to all of our attendees, thank you so much for being involved and just to let you know, I'll be sending a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides, the recording and all the information mentioned throughout. Michael and Matt, thank you so much for this great presentation. It's been fantastic. And again, thanks to all our attendees. I hope you all have a great day. Thanks everyone.